But, but that's, the kind of, that's the kind of sermon we're going to have today. It's going to be one of those sermons that's going to fill you up. In fact, look at your neighbor and say, announce to them the title of today's message. Fill the jar. Look at your other neighbor and say, fill the jar. Hold up a jar to heaven and say, God, fill this jar today. I believe God has a word for you, so much so that last night I was giving birth in the middle of the night. Giving birth to a kidney stone. Yeah. And um, it wasn't really my heart that was hurting, but thank you for that. <laughs> just, just saying. <laughs> Jesus, come on back, Holy Spirit. So... So, um, but I know that God has a word for you today. So take your Bibles and turn with me to John chapter 2, verses 1 through 12. As you're turning to John chapter 2, verses 1 through 12, let me just say this. Um, we've, this is installment number two, and I know you've been standing for a little while. Just, just hang loose with me. Um, my wife was seated for whatever reason, but um, that's okay. Um, you just stay, stay up with me, but hang on. Um, here we are in this installment number two of this series called uh, More Than a Miracle, where we're looking at the miracles of, of Jesus according to the Gospel of John. But, but not just the miracle. The, we all know the miracles. I, I want to look at the lesson, the object lesson behind the miracle that Jesus is trying to teach us. So let me read to you part of the narrative, um, and then we're going to do some work here and um, find out what it is that, that John is trying to show us. Here's what John chapter 2 verse 1 says. It says, on the third day, everybody say the third day, a wedding took place at Cana in Galilee. Jesus' mother was there, and Jesus and his disciples had also been invited to the wedding. Now let me just help you understand something. This is a wedding party. Now, according to that culture, the wedding party should be the party of all parties. I mean, like a throwdown. And Jesus is at the party. Historians and theologians would say that generally a party like this, the family would receive an invitation. And when the family receives the invitation, they can invite one additional person. So it's the family plus one. So Mary would have received the invitation and the invitation would have been good for Jesus and his brothers. However, Jesus didn't invite just one. He invited the 12 disciples to come along with him. So here we have Jesus inviting the 12 disciples because he knows that eventually this lesson that's going to be taught at this wedding party is going to be an object lesson that's going to convert the disciples from unbelievers to believers. But what's really cool about this is that the disciples are crashing the wedding. Wedding crashers. Somebody look at your neighbor and say, wedding crashers. Let me tell you something. Hollywood thought that they had an original theme, but no, no, no. This was the first wedding crashers. And Vince Vaughn and Owen Wilson had nothing on Jesus. Jesus went to that party, crashing that party in a supernatural way, saying, yeah, I'm here. Bam! Look what happens. Look what happens. Verse 3 and following says, when the wine was gone, Jesus' mother said to him, they have no more wine. Woman, why do you involve me? Jesus replied, my hour has not yet come. His mother said to the servants, do whatever he tells you to do. Nearby stood six stone water jars, the kind used by the Jews for ceremonial washing, each holding from 20 to 30 gallons. Jesus said to the servants, fill the jars with water. So they filled them to the brim. How many of you know we got a God that don't, does not do something halfway? Then he told them, now draw out some and take it to the master of the banquet. They did so, and the master of the banquet tasted the water and he had, that uh, had been turned into wine. He did not realize where it had come from, though the servants who had drawn the water knew. Then he called the bridegroom aside and he said, everyone brings out the choice wine first and then the cheaper wine after the guests have had too much to drink. But you have saved the best until now. 
What Jesus did here in Cana of Galilee was the first of many signs through which he revealed his glory and his disciples believed in him. After this, he went down to Capernaum with his mother and brothers and the disciples, and they, there they stayed for a few days. Now, hang on. I'm going to let you be seated right after this. Verse 7 is the verse that we derive our title from. Jesus said to the servants, fill the jars with water. So they filled them to the brim. Fill the jars. Look at your neighbor and say, fill the jars. Now you can be seated. Fill the jars. Keep playing, D. That's good. Fill the jars. I love how John articulates his gospel. Telling us with great detail about this conversion of the water to the wine. It's not just a small miracle. It is a, an incredible miracle. In fact, he says there's six stone water jars that are used for the ceremonial purification of the old law. Six of them holding roughly 30 gallons apiece. There's 180 gallons of wine now at this party. John is telling us this because we need to understand that when an explosion of grace comes on the scene, God doesn't just give us just enough. The Bible says that he is more than enough in our moment of weakness. Somebody say, fill the jar because he is my supply. He doesn't supply for me based upon what I have. He shall supply for me according to his riches in glory. Every good gift comes down from the Father above. Why? Because Jesus doesn't do a halfway miracle. It's not half full or half empty. He fills it all the way to the brim. Somebody say fill the jar. Mm, Y'all going to help me preach today? Fill the jar. There's so much happening in this narrative of Scripture. So much theologically, so much historically. So can I pause my preach for a minute so that I can teach? Is that okay? Here John in his gospel captures the very first miracle or according to John the very first sign the very first sign that would prove the deity of Jesus Christ and what is so cool about this sign is that it is not coincidental and certainly not ironic that this particular sign the very first miracle that Jesus performs is deeply connected to the very first miracle that Moses performed Moses in the Old Testament was this savior type figure who led the people out of bondage across the Red Sea and into the promise of a land. Moses, this savior figure, really was the precursor of the coming savior, Jesus Christ. Moses led the people out of, of captivity and into the promised land. Jesus led people out of a greater captivity and into the promise of salvation. Moses led the people across the Israelites across the Red Sea on dry ground into the promise of a land. Jesus led the people into the promise of eternity. The very first miracle that Moses performs deals with water. The very first mi miracle that Jesus performs deals with water. The first miracle that Moses performs is a parting of the water. The first miracle that Jesus performs is a pouring of the water. The first miracle that Moses performs is the turning back of the Red Sea, the turning back of the water. The first miracle that Jesus performs is the turning of water into wine. The miracle that Moses performs when the people leave Egypt and go into what should be the promised land is leaving something old and going into something new. The miracle that Jesus symbolizes is leaving the old covenant and going into the new covenant. Lord have mercy. And remember that Jesus, thank you, D. remember that Jesus is invited to this wedding. Somebody say invited. What is so cool is that this story is telling us that when we invite Jesus into our lives, the invitation of bringing Jesus into every event of our lives brings change. The invitation of Jesus to this wedding tells us something that will happen in our lives when we invite Jesus into the events of our life. 
I love the complexities of this gospel. It's one of the most profound, yet at the same time, one of the most simplistic. This is not just a miracle, Jonathan, that is the conversion of water into wine. This is a miracle of conversion where Jesus is, is, is showing people that the law that Moses brought is now going away because you're going to live the new life that I am bringing. It's the conversion principle, the conversion miracle, because Moses brought the law, and what Jesus now is doing is bringing grace. We need to understand this miracle, the complexities of this miracle. This miracle is, is a very, very deep miracle. So in order for you to understand the context of this miracle, let me dissect it a little bit more. Because in verses 1 through 3, John highlights for us what the problem is. In verses 1 through 3, let me read this to you. It says, on the third day, a wedding took place at Cana in Galilee. Jesus' mother was there, and Jesus and his disciples had also been invited to the wedding. When the wine was gone, Jesus' mother said to him, they have no more wine. The problem. Mary is having a conversation with her son, Jesus. Jesus is having a conversation with his mother, Mary. There is a sidebar conversation that is happening at this wedding. All of these people are around, and Mary comes to Jesus and highlights the problem, highlights the crisis. She says, there is no more wine. It's all gone, Jesus. It's about to be pandemonium up in this place. All of the red solo cups that you see here are empty. It's a crisis. Mary is outlining and identifying for Jesus the crisis that is there at the wedding. The crisis comes in the form of lack, and the product that they are lacking is wine. Why is that a crisis? Well, to understand that, you have to understand that culture. During that day and age, if someone hosted a party like this, especially a wedding party, the host was responsible for making sure that there was enough supply of everything at the party to make sure that there was no social disgrace upon the couple. And if you ran out of wine, that was the worst thing to run out of because now you have socially disgraced this couple. It, it's, it's, it's an embarrassment to them. There will always be this shade upon this couple because it's a close-knit community and everybody's going to remember what happened at their wedding. So Mary comes because this is considered a social embarrassment and she cries out to Jesus, there's no more wine. Not only is, is this, this incredible social embarrassment, but also during that day and age, according to history, when you went to a wedding party, you were responsible for bringing a wedding gift. And if your wedding gift was deemed to be inadequate, you could be sued. So this is a legal issue. Mary says, there's no more wine. Not only that, but you need to understand this. During the day of Jesus, wine was the symbol for joy. Wine was the symbol for joy, so Mary could be outlining another issue. You see, you're there to pronounce joy upon the couple who is getting married. Now the symbol for joy is gone. They've run out. The social embarrassment that takes place, she comes to the Savior. There is no more wine, the symbol of joy, but yet the Savior is the one who gives joy. Mary knew something that no one else knew. Mary eagerly, eagerly anticipated the, the time when Jesus would, would, would tell everyone, show everyone that he is the Messiah. So what Mary is doing is bringing the problem to the one that she knows can solve the problem. Mm. Mary is bringing the problem to the one who is the solution. There is no more wine. There is no more joy. Here she's bringing the problem, the symbol that there's no more joy because they ran out of wine. She's bringing it to the Savior who offers us joy. So she's identified for us the cultural issues, the, re the relational issues, the, the, the legal issues. She's having this conversation with Jesus. What would be his response? 
Look at verse 4. You've got to see it. Here's what he says in verse 4. Woman, how many of you have called your mom woman? Anybody in here? Woman, let me just go ahead and say this. This is a term of endearment. Woman, why do you involve me? My hour has not yet come. Woman, it's another way to say, what do you want me to do about it? How many of you have ever used that statement? What do you want me to do about it? Like when your kid runs to you and he's holding his PlayStation 4 controller and he says, my PlayStation 4 controller doesn't work, Dad. What do you want me to do about it? Or when your son runs to you and he says, hey, Dad, you remember the next door neighbor? He's got a dog that can catch a baseball. You remember you've seen him, you've seen him throw the baseball to him real soft and he catches it in his mouth. Oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. Well, I wanted to see how good he could catch. And so I threw the baseball as hard as I could and I hit him in the head and I think he's dead. What you want me to do about it? <laughs> or, or when somebody brings something to you that is above your pay grade and they want you to fix it, they think that you know everything, like Google. And you just look at them like a deer in the headlights, like, well, what do you want me to do about it? Here's Jesus. What do you want me to do about it? The thing is, Mary knew something about Jesus that nobody else at the party knew. Mary wasn't coming to Jesus as her son. Mary knew that Jesus was the intercessor. Whew. So Mary was bringing the problem to the intercessor. She was not just saying there is no wine. Mary could have been saying there is no joy. There is no peace. There is no hope. There is no breakthrough. We don't know what the answer is. We don't know how to get out of the situation. We don't know how to fix the situation. There is none of this. There is none of that. There is lack. There is all of these problems. Mary is bringing the problem to the word, hoping that she can get a word. Hold on a second. If you'll remember, week number one of this, John chapter one says that in the beginning was the word and the word was with God and the word was God another name for Jesus is the word what John is telling us is that in the beginning Jesus was there what John is telling us is that Jesus came from heaven demonstrating that he is God what Mary is doing is bringing the problem to the word and hopes that the word will speak a word in order to heal the problem what Mary is doing is saying it doesn't matter what your problem is all you have to do is bring your problem to Jesus because Jesus wants you to seek him he's inviting you to seek him because he is your solution Lord have mercy when was the last time that you invited Jesus into your unusual problem so Mary is coming to Jesus wanting to lean upon his compassion because she knows how compassionate that Jesus is he is the intercessor She's wanting to lean upon his compassion because she knows that everyone there doesn't realize this about him yet. They don't understand that he's the Messiah yet. But she's wanting people to realize that something that, that seems so meaningless to us, that he turned water into wine, an issue that's not ours because 2,000 years later, we're, we're not there. And so it really, we think, well, it doesn't mean that much to us. But Mary was trying to prove to us that if Jesus was concerned about this wedding party going bad, how much more would Jesus be concerned about your need? No matter how big or how small, she's proving to us that Jesus is, is concerned about your need. He has compassion on your need. So when everything began to run dry, she ran to the supply that will never run dry because he is the first, the last, the beginning, the end, the creator of, of the heavens. He is the one who pours out every good gift. It comes from above. He is our rock. He is our fortress. He shall meet all of my needs according to his riches and glory. And he turned the water into wine, not because the wine is the symbol of joy he turned the water into wine because he is joy you see the word came to the wedding bringing a gift of joy there might have been a lack of joy in the place so the word spoke the answer over the party and he said I am joy mm. the word was at the wedding bearing the best gift of all You see, this is not, when we read this, it's not just the water into wine. You've heard preachers preach it. It's the water into wine. It's not just the water into wine. This is, a, this is a, the mission of Jesus Christ. It's the conversion mission. He's going after the heart. 
because it's not about water into wine because later we find out that the disciples gave their hearts to Christ because of this. So what it really is is not a scientific project. It's not some experiment. It's causing the disciples to move from unbelievers to believers. <laughs> and this miracle is so much deeper than that. I love this miracle. This miracle, in fact, the six stone jars that Jesus chose, these six stone jars are connected to the Old Testament law. They are used for the ceremonial washing and purification. Jesus chooses these six jars. He chooses the servants, and he says to the servants, go fill the jars. And the Bible says the servants went and filled the jars to the brim. He's utilizing someone in the miracle besides himself. Hold on, what's the teaching lesson here? Do you remember last week we talked, or two weeks ago, we talked about the miracle where Jesus took the five loaves and the two fish? We don't know exactly where the miracle took place. We don't know if it took place when he lifted it up. We don't know if the miracle took place in his hands. We don't know if the miracle took place when the disciples passed out all of the food. All we know is that there was a miracle. The reason why we don't know all of those details is because God wants us to see that A, we need him, but B, he works through us to do the miraculous. So here he says to the servants, go and get those six pots, those ordinary pots that everybody has been walking by today. Everybody has ignored today because I want to do something extraordinary through the ordinary. I wrote this down. I don't want to mess it up. So let me read to you what I wrote down. So now think about this. God could have supplied for this miracle in so many different ways. He could have filled the jars himself. He could have used whatever means, whatever device, whatever apparatus that they had that was holding the first go around of wine and just filled it up. Go over there and look, it's there. But he didn't do that. Instead, he chose something that was on hand. I wrote this down. God will use things that you already have access to before he will give you more things to access. Oh, Lord. Did you grab that? God will use things that you already have access to before he will give you more things to access. Let me get up in your business for a minute. We're always looking for more from God, but yet we ignore the blessing that he's already given us. God, I want more. I want a, God, I want a pay raise. Give me a pay raise, God. I need a, a pay raise, God. I, I need a pay raise, God. But we ignore the jar that he's already filled with the money that we have already have because we're not using it in such a way that brings him glory. Hello? God, I want a pay raise, but yet w the jar that he's already filled, we're not using to pay tithes, to bring the tithes back into the storehouse, if you will. God, I, I want to have influence on the job. Give me a greater position of influence, but yet we're not using the position that we already have to influence those that are around us. God, I want more blessings in my life, but yet we ignore the blessings that we already have. God, I want more selflessness in my relationships, but yet all we do is practice selfishness. Am I preaching? Hello, am I preaching? And so, here Jesus uses something that everybody else has been walking by on a regular basis in order to bring the miraculous. He uses something ordinary to do the extraordinary, but he even uses the ordinary person so that we can see that we could be used. He uses the servants in the house, and he says, I want you to fill up the jars. He places them in a position to be blessed. He gives them this directive. Go and fill up the jars. He gives them a directive. He places them in the position to be blessed. Why? Because he knows if they'll share in the work, they will also share in the blessing. Hello? If they share in the work, they will share in the blessing. And so the servants filled the jars to the brim. Therefore, the, the miracle could be just that much greater. Had the servants only filled the jars halfway up, had the servants been lazy, had the servants been inconsistent, there would have been less wine. Mm. Hold on a second. Let me just tell you something. We don't know why there was 180 gallons of wine. That seems like an awful lot. 
But historians tell us something about parties like that. The leftovers generally were given to the bride and the groom, and they could do with them as they will, and many times they would sell those items in order to help with their own personal expenses. It's quite possible that there was so much wine left over that they were able to use it, and it was the best wine. Do you remember what the Bible said? It was the best wine that they could use it to sell so that they could pay bills. God's grace is not just enough. It's more than enough. Hello? But there's something that is present in verse 8 that I need you to see. Verse 8 says this. Then he told them, now draw some out and take it to the master of the banquet. Here's what's important. It's the next three words. They did so. Somebody say, they did so. They did so. Hold on a second. They didn't just hear the word of the Lord. They acted upon the word of the Lord. The miracle in your life is not when you hear the word. The miracle in your life is when you act upon what you've heard. Hello. In your faith, you're going to have a choice of who to listen to or what to listen to. Listen to me. You're going to have a choice of who to listen to or what to listen to. You can listen to what the enemy says about you. You can listen to what your insecurities say about you. You can listen to what your fear says about you. You can listen to what your circumstances say about you. And the more that you listen to those things, those things will begin to control your thought process. And when they begin to control your thought process, they'll begin to control your steps. Therefore, you will be acting on what you heard. But at some point in time in your faith, you've got to take the word of God that has been spoken over your life in the written form. And you've got to begin to not only hear it, but you've got to begin to do it. Because the miracle is not when you hear it. The miracle is when you do it. So this past week, I I had a telephone call from a family here in the church, and and the lady, she told me that she had just been to the doctor and found out that she's wrapped up with cancer. It was news to her, a very aggressive form of cancer, and if she did not have a surgery within the next few days, that she would probably be dead within two weeks. And even if she has the surgery, and the surgery works and chemo works, They give her 10 months to live. And as she's telling me that, she says, you know what, though, Pastor Mark, she said, that's what the doctor said. But I'm hanging on to what Jesus said. Lord have mercy. Fill the jar. Fill the jar. What I'm trying to say to you is if you need breakthrough in your life, fill the jar and become someone else's breakthrough. If you need love in your life, fill the jar and pour it out on somebody else so they can experience love. If you need financial freedom in your life, fill the jar up and pour out an offering before the Lord. If you know of someone else who needs to be healed in their life, then fill up your jar and pour out blessing upon them. Come on, somebody. You've got to fill the jar because the miracle in your life comes when you act upon the word it comes because God uses what you already have access to and your miracle listen what God is doing through you is not because you can do a miracle for God it's because God wants to do a miracle through you so it's time for you to lift up your jar to heaven and say God fill this jar because you are the one who can transform my life fill this jar God fill this jar because I want to do your work fill this jar in my marriage fill this jar in my relationships fill this jar in my income Fill this jar in my career. Fill this jar for my kids. Fill this jar for my body. Because you and you alone, God, can convert the water into wine. You can convert my sorrow into joy. My lack into plenty. My past into my future. Oh, Lord, have mercy. Somebody get up on your feet and begin to give God praise. Look at your neighbor and say, fill the jar. Fill the jar, fill the jar, fill fill the jar. Hold on a second, fill the jar. Because it's not a miracle of water into wine. It's, It's the conversion principle of God. How God can take lack and turn it into plenty. How God can take pain and turn it into gain. How God can take sorrow and turn... 
and turn it into joy. How God can take hopelessness and turn it into hope. How God can take your yesterday and turn it into your tomorrow. How God can take what is broken in your life and turn it into something whole. Verse 11 says something. Verse 11 says something. It says this. Put it up for me. It says, what Jesus did here in Cana of Galilee was the first of the signs. Why? I've given it all to you. There's a connection to the Old Testament. Now there is a coming into the new covenant. There's the principle of the ministry of Jesus to convert those who are not believers into believers. Look what it says. It says, this was the first sign through which he revealed his glory and his disciples believed in him. And his disciples, James, believed in him. Fill the jar. Fill the jar. Somebody look at your neighbor and say, fill the jar. Look at your other neighbor and say, fill the jar. Fill the jar. The miracle that took place was the result of the willingness of the servants to fill the jar. The miracle is in your belly. Your breakthrough. It's already been spoken over your life. It's time for you to stop just hearing it and begin living.